Greetings. My name is Dr. Michael Franklin, and I'm here to present to you uh, some information about machine vision with TensorFlow and Vuforia. Helping me out with this presentation is Molly Franklin and the other members of Team 10068 Duct Ties and Zip Tape. We hope you're all having an excellent day as we dive into this presentation. Looking forward to sharing this with you, and I hope that you're having an amazing day. Here we go. We talk about machine vision. We're talking about how a computer perceives the world, right? So what is machine vision? Um, and that, that's this idea we're trying to get at. How do machines see the world? How do they envision it? And it seems very trivi trivial for us. And this is one of the biggest problems you'll run into with machine vision or computer vision is the disconnect between how our human eyes work, or at least how we think they work, and how a computer sees the world. As an example, if you look around the room you're in right now, and I asked you to find a clock on the wall, right? You would immediately know exactly where to look uh, on the on your plane of vision to know where to look for a clock. Now there might not be a clock in your room, but you certainly wouldn't be like a computer or a robot and say, well, let me look. Okay, I'm gonna look up at the ceiling. I'm gonna check the ceiling and then I'm gonna check the, the carpet, check the floor. You would know to look about this line right here. Okay, if there's one here, it's gotta be right here somewhere, right? So that's what you would know. You you have that intuition and other people don't, right? And that's that's important for us to see so that we understand kind of what people are seeing, what they're not seeing. Right. Computer vision isn't that intelligent. So looking at my video right here, you can see I would start if I was a computer and I was looking for a clock, I'd start in this picture because this is all I can see. And I would just scan right across this for looking for anything that looks like a clock. And I would go across here and look for a clock. Right. This is how computers think. This is this. They don't understand what anything is that you're talking about. Right. So that's how they would scan that picture. That's how they'd be looking at all the information that they're trying to see. Right. And so um, I think that's important for us, you know, to, to see and to understand. Right. So um, that's how computers see the world. But do they understand what they're even looking for? Do they even understand what they're what we're talking about? Right. Do they even get it when we talk about what they're trying to see or what they're what we're asking them to find? Do they know that? So let's go back to my question. Find a clock in your room. Right. Well, first off, you have to tell a computer, what does the word find mean? Right. We have to describe what find even that process is. It's very difficult for computers because we call this classically in computer science, the symbol grounding problem. Right. How do I attach a meaning to a word? So when I say the word find to another human being, they know exactly what that word means. Search until you locate. Right. But if I tell a computer to find something, it has no intuition about what that word means. It doesn't even understand English, right? It doesn't understand how to interpret those words and, and those letters to even form a word to begin to look it up, right? So it's not, there's no inherent knowledge in there. So we have to, to ground those symbols. We have to tell it what find means. So we have to say, okay, when, we, when someone says find, they mean search the pixel space until you find an object, all right? The second thing is find the clock. So we say, all right, what is the clock, right? Uh, I have to tell it what a clock is. And I might use something like a, a neural network or deep learning to feed it a thousand images of clocks over and over and over again until it can learn to recognize various and, and sundry different clocks that are out there, right? But this process of training it is, again, symbol grounding. I'm teaching it what I mean when someone says clock. I'm teaching it what that means, right? How they can understand it. So when we ask what is machine vision, this is really the essence of this question is how do computers see the world? Another example is uh, from my own robot experience is telling a robot, we have little humanoid robots and we say, okay, robot, go find the red ball, right? And it's like, great, what does find mean? What does red mean? Because red can mean many things to different, many different people. Um, some people might see magenta as red. Other people might see a bright red as red. Other people might be colorblind, have a red uh, deficiency in their, in their color vision and they might not see red at all. Um, so red is very, very speculative, right? And then when I say ball, that could mean so many things. Could mean a soccer ball, could be a Nerf ball, could be a football, could be a ping pong ball, could be a golf ball, could be so many different things. But as humans, we implicitly understand if I asked you to hand me that red ball over there or find the red ball, that you would immediately categorize instantly without having to think it through, even though your brain, by the way, is doing what we're talking about the program doing, you would immediately understand in context that the red rounded object you found is most likely what I'm looking for, right? That's called a fuzzy logic search, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking for, but I know it's gonna be red-ish. I know it's gonna be ball-ish, right? But it might be a football. I might look at it and go, oh, okay, that's probably what he meant there, right? That ability that humans have is incredible, right? Our engineer that built us gave us incredible horsepower to understand and be able to think through things like that, incredible, right? 
but computers weren't built that way. They don't understand any of this technology. So we have to think that through. So do they understand color? Do they understand distance? Do they understand orientation? Do they understand location, right? And these are things that we struggle with even as humans. One good example of this is a, is a temporal problem. When I say, let's hang out next Friday. To some people, next Friday means the very next Friday that happens. And so you would start from today, and you would iterate through days until you found a Friday, and that is the Friday that I must have meant because I said next Friday. To other people, when you say next Friday, you mean not this Friday, but the one after that, right? Um, and so even, even there, we see that human language can also be a bit unclear. And so that's a, that's a pivotal thing for us to really understand, is how do I communicate to a computer what even we as human beings struggle with? So color is a big deal because we have to, we have to help them understand what colors are, we're talking about, find the yellow block. Well, the yellow block has a lot of ambiguity to it, right? How do we figure all those things out? Distance is another thing. Unless you have a distance sensor, it's very difficult to determine the distance to an object, right? So we either have to have a known map of understanding where that thing is, where all the objects are, or we have to have some kind of sensor to be able to tell us how far away an object is. Orientation is also difficult because we tend to orient ourselves with respect in, in, in first robotics, we tend to think about the table or the field, right? And so we orient ourselves towards the field. So here's the starting corner and here's the starting location. And so we orient from there. But some levels of robotics, you might be playing with another partner in there and, and you're driving the robot together. And then you have an alliance set of, a set of alliance partners that are there as well. And you're all coordinating, but how do you talk about left, right, forward and backwards? Do you agree on some kind of orientation? Well, again, robots and computers, they have very little understanding of what orientation means. So do you mean from your eye perspective, do you mean from some universal global orientation like north? You know, when we talk about the position north, it doesn't matter where on the planet you are, north should be the same for everyone, right? But if I said left, well, that just depends on which way you're facing. Right, and so that's that kind of ambiguity we have to work with. Well, in, the com in computer vision or machine vision, or in our case with robotics, are you talking about your human eye orientation? Are you talking about the field orientation? Or are you talking about the robot's orientation? And while those might seem like trivial concerns, they make a huge difference. If I'm gonna ask the robot to go from where it is to some other location, I have to be able to understand orientation. So the question on the slide is, do they understand color? No. Do they understand distance? Not a chance. Do they understand orientation? Of course not. And do they even understand where they are? Nope, they have no idea. You have to tell them all of this information or you have to help them figure out how to derive that information. And that's why the machine vision or the computer vision problem is a huge area of research for people all across the world. Uh, my PhD is in computer science I, and I um, built that in my, my area of specialization is artificial intelligence. And so that's what I spent a lot of time doing. So artificial intelligence robotics is what I did my PhD in. And I spent a lot of time in that space. And so I'll tell you that wrestling with this problem at the nano scale, at the smallest possible level, or at the largest possible level, it's a real problem. We all are in love with driverless cars. We're all fascinated by them. And we're, we're thinking that's fantastic. And that's great. They are amazing. But we also need to understand and recognize that what those cars are being asked to do is very difficult. It's so difficult, in fact, that human beings have accidents every single day. So if we, with all of our multitasking ability and all our fuzzy logic ability and all of our classification and categorization ability, if we continue to make mistakes, if we consistently have issues and trouble and close calls and accidents, then we should never expect our computer vision-based partners, right, these robotic cars, to be able to do much differently or much better than that. So I tell people when I talk about driverless cars, I'm not looking for them to be perfect, although I hope they will be. I, I'm looking for them to have an accident rate that is about the same as the human's accident rate, because that's our, that's our significant marker, right, as our human being rate. All right, so enough about that. We'll come back to it in a minute, but that's kind of my world. Even at large-scale robotics, we, we wrestle with this issue. How do I help a computer understand what I'm talking about? How do I help it to see what I mean when I'm giving it a command or asking it to do something for me? All right. We also have to understand ratios. So ratios, when we look at an image, and, and you're, if you're looking at my video image, it's at a 16 by 9. It's a widescreen uh, picture, um, and it's, it might be a 16 by 10, depending on what sort of camera you're using or what sort of camera I'm using or what your screen layout is or what my screen layout is. And these are about ratios, right? So we talk about square. We talk about 4 by 4. 
That's not something we see very often. A typical monitor is a four by three, uh, but that's old school. We don't do four by three much anymore. Most of your television screens now are 16 by nine or a theater wide is a, a 16 by 10 ratio. But this ratio of pixels helps us to understand something very important. So my video that you're looking at right now and the, the screen you're seeing is taken in widescreen format. So as a result, it's much wider than it is tall, which means I have many, many more pixels uh, to, to deal with when I'm looking at it like that. But the camera on your robot might be oriented as a four by three. In other words, it's a different aspect ratio than your monitor. And so this can be very, excuse me, very confusing for your robot and very confusing for you trying to read through and, and logic through and code through how to make that talk. So make sure you're very, you're very cognizant of this fact that you might be dealing with different pixel ratios. I know, pixels, 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 right? Now, pixels are picture elements. They're the smallest element of a screen. It's the smallest thing we can use to describe an object. Typically, we think about a pixel or a picture element as being one dot on the screen. It's not a very good picture of that, but that's, that's a good idea to think about it. Um, and if you want to think about it, if uh, you have your parents or your grandparents around, you can ask them to tell you what a light bright set is. And a light bright set, every peg hole would be a pixel in this case. And you can put a different color peg in there and it will shine brightly through that. If you've never seen a light bright before, go look one up on YouTube with your parents' permission and with their assistance. And you can laugh at them as they uh, think about how great those things were. And you laugh at them about how, how rudimentary they were. Um, but anyway, when we think about a pixel, that's that small picture element. I know most of you are very, very familiar with them but I can change the hue or the intensity depending on my color schema. I can change the, the value of that pixel, or that picture element, and I can change its appearance, the color of, uh, that it appears. And so some of them have, the pixels are actually made up of multiple elements and they have a red and a blue and a green element. Uh, some of them are quite fancy and they might have up to nine different color elements inside of every pixel, but most of them use a single picture element and they blend the colors together to create that color that they wanna show. Right? And their ability to do that is what uh, the difference between a $1,000 television and a $3,000 or $5,000 television, um, that's what you're paying for. That ability to discriminate um, the light colors and the, the brightness of each pixel and the resolution of those, of those pixels, right? Anyway, so that's what we're talking about. When you think about computer vision, that's exactly what we're talking about. If I have a camera that does 640 by 480, which would be pretty low resolution, that's VGA resolution. If I did that, uh, I would have 640 pixels in one dimension and 480 in the other. That's that, those are all the pixels I have to find everything I need to find. If I do a 1024 by 768, what used to be called SVGA or Super VGA, most people don't call it that anymore, but I would have more pixels to describe that. If I step up to high definition, 1920 by 1080 as an example, um, 3180 by 2160, if I go to 4K, uh, et cetera, on to 8K, the more pixels I have, the more information I have. That sounds awesome, but remember that I also have the other side of that problem. The more resolution I have in the, in the camera image, the longer it's gonna take me to sort of work through that, and the, the less, the, the less uh, power and speed I'm gonna have, it's gonna require more power to process each frame Frame because I have so many more pixels inside of that space, right? So it's not a guarantee that you always want the highest resolution camera you can. Now, let me say this a different way. What you may want to do is get the best camera you can, but run it at a different resolution to see how well it works. Because at a lower resolution, you'll have much higher performance, and that much higher performance might translate to a much better operation for your robot, right? So just make sure you test it at those uh, various resolutions. So it's all about pixels, 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 right? All right, so then what is computer vision or what is machine vision? What is TensorFlow, right? So let's get into these topics a little bit. <clears throat> TensorFlow based on tensors, based on the mathematics of tensors that perform an algebraic transformation that maps one's basis vector space to that of another space based on the well-designed systems of integrated linear equations and implicit conversions available via differential calculus according to the well-known covariant and contravariant laws, I'm sure you all know, enabling a smooth translational flow from one state to another without having to perform pedantic repetitive calculations stepwise across all dimensions. <laughs> all right, uh, I'm just kidding. You don't, need to, you don't need to know all of that. But if you need to know it, there it is for you. A little bit of math, a little bit of, uh, of, a, of a preview behind the scenes of, of what's happening there. Now let's get serious, right? TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is based on tensors. Tensors are multi-valued or multi-dimensional inputs that have been transformed into outputs of a different dimension. 
and it might sound a little bit fancy, but it's essentially saying if I wanted to understand that uh, a square, one of the little yellow blocks that we've used in, in first competitions for a while, if I want to understand that one of those little yellow blocks, well, it exists in three space, right? It has an X and a Y and a Z location, right? And if I want to say, where is that thing? I might say, well, it's in quadrant A or it's in position number seven if I have a map of positions. And by using the X, Y, and Z, I translate that into position seven. I've essentially changed it from a three-dimensional object into a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional object, right? And that's the idea behind TensorFlows is that I can, I can use these multidimensional variables that map a big picture of, of how the world is viewed, and I can translate them very quickly with some cool little fancy math tricks into giving me more uh, reasonable or more useful uh, information, right? Um, and we boil that down into having an, an information that has a semantic meaning, right? That the object is in bounds or out of bounds, or that I have found the yellow block or I found the red block. Even though we have multidimensional information that's feeding into that system, we have a simple output that's feeding out of that system. And that's a good example of tensors. So TensorFlow is a, a kind of a trademark version of tensors. Tensors is a mathematical construct. Um, and when you go to university, you'll have a good chance to dig into that math. It's a lot of great fancy math. Um, if you have the ambition ahead of time, I certainly invite you to do it. It will really help you if you've taken Calculus 1 and Calculus 2. Um, you might wish you had a little bit of differential equations in there. Um, though, so we would have called that Calculus 3, but FEQs is sometimes part of Calc 2. That will help, but certainly something you read up on, on your own. There are a lot of great white papers out there and presentations, not the topic for today. We're talking about how to use TensorFlow inside of machine vision or computer vision, so that we'll stay focused on that. All right, so why do we like TensorFlow? Well, this maps really nicely and really tightly with artificial neural networks or ANNs. An artificial neural network, and that's what the diagram is showing, it has in the yellow squares, it shows a number of input layers. Here it has three input variables. And then it has a number of hidden layers. In this case, it has two hidden layers. And each of these hidden layers has four nodes in it. And finally, we have an output layer. That output layer is a decision layer. Now, this is just a simple example, but you could have 89 input layers, right? Uh, 89, I'm sorry, you only have one input layer. You could have 89 nodes in your input layer, and then you could have 16 nodes in your hidden layer one, and then you could have eight nodes in your hidden layer two, and then you could have four nodes in your output or you could have any combination of those you might imagine. You could have 64 inputs, you could go to 256 in the hidden layer one, 1024 in hidden layer two, and then you go to, to 48 outputs or 16 outputs or two outputs if you want a binary classifier. So the idea of an artificial neural network is that I am using an aggregated weighting of inputs to determine the correct output. Now, there's a lot I could say about artificial neural networks. Some people love them and think they're great. I'm gonna tell you a little secret. They are pretty magical at being really terrible guessers, but if you reinforce them enough, you will eventually get them to train pretty well for the categorization that you want. But they're not very smart. They don't really know what they're doing. They don't really understand what's happening. They just guess, and they guess a lot. And the way it works is I train the neural network by feeding it inputs, right? And it, gets an, it, it comes up with an answer, and I tell it, boy, that's wrong, and it fixes that error on the way back. And then it gets another example, and it gets it really wrong, and I, I tell it how to fix it on the way back. And I keep doing this training, a training sample, back propagation, training sample, back propagation. And eventually what happens as it adjusts those weights every single time is it's slowly learning. Now it's not learning because it understands what's it do, what it's doing. And that's an important artificial neural network key there. It has no clue what it's doing, but it's optimizing because I am telling it what is right and what is wrong. In other words, it's supervised learning. I'm telling it that example is right or that example is wrong, right? And so because of that, it requires that kind of intelligence. So don't ever believe that an ANN can somehow learn. It doesn't do it. It doesn't work like that. It is trained. And I don't want you to confuse those two topics. Anyway, I'll nerd out about AI some other time. I'll stay focused on what we're talking about today. So TensorFlows, because they're multidimensional inputs, and we're trying to translate down to an output that says, is this a ball or not? Is this a yellow block or not? We, that's the answer we want. Then we might we, we can see how that aligns really well, all these inputs aligning really well with the singular output I want. And that's what tensors do. So tensors map really tightly or really strongly with there. Right? Artificial neural networks are the, the core of deep machine learning. Most people just call it deep learning now. Right? And deep learning is basically a neural network of neural networks. 
And what it does is it says, all right, if a neural network is one guess, one hypothesis, if we're going to be accurate about it, then the more hypotheses I have in my hypothesis space, then the more I can learn, the more I can understand, the more I can, I can understand how to, how to think about the world. So I told you that one artificial neural network configuration might be like this one, four, uh, th sorry, three, four, four, one. But it might be better to have three, eight, four, two. Or it might be better to have three, sixty-four, twenty-two, one, or whatever. And so with a deep learning neural network, right, with this idea of doing deep learning, I set up a neural network that has a trillion neural nets inside of it of all different configurations and shapes. And I have all of them trained all of the time. And eventually what happens is the system will learn which of those, or it will be trained, which one of those neural network configurations performs the best. Again, it's supervised learning. Now, people are in love with deep learning, and I understand why. It's really cool. It's intoxicatingly neat, and I love that bit of technology. But let's be clear about this. It is really good at categorizing, is there a dog in, in these pictures, right? It's really good to determine, is there a cat in this picture? But if I fed it dogs and cats, its ability to learn both of those simultaneously would be quite cloudy. Right. It would be a, I would have to use a hybridized or a different kind of an ensemble approach to machine learning to be able to accurately classify both dogs and cats because of the, the similar coloring and the similar similar idea with fur. And other things like that. Now, if I had red, uh, red circles and blue squares, then I could keep those held in different spaces. But if I had red circles and red octagons, it would be really hard for it to learn both of those things and do them very well. Right, uh, especially if it's differentiating between red hexagons or, 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 or something else of similar nature. So that's a little bit about TensorFlow. It, it helps us because it maps really well to an artificial neural network and ANN. ANNs help us because they're a part of deep learning. Deep learning helps us to learn how to learn what we're doing. So the TensorFlow folks have taken this huge library and they, they jam through tons of training examples of all the possible variants of what a yellow, one of the yellow FTC blocks could look like. I have a picture of one later. And, and they, send, they send it all the possible poses and orientations and they tell it every time you see this, hey man, this is one of those yellow blocks, I promise it is. And they feed it forward. And so TensorFlow comes pre-programmed or at least the library that you can, you can, you can load in comes pre-programmed with a lot of this training already done for you. And that's a very, very powerful tool for you to be able to use. But if it didn't do that, somebody somewhere has to do this work. And that might be you. You might have to be the one who, you might be the one who has to train it and has to give it all of these examples. So you have a lot of options here in each and every one of these cases. But this is what TensorFlow is doing. So ANNs and deep learning are great image classification. They're great for image classification when the objects are known. If you know what you're looking for, I need to know this red ball, this, this yellow square. I need to know this face or that, that I'm looking for a dog or whatever else I'm doing. All of those things are extremely helpful in that context, right? They're good for that. Not always great for everything. They're not wonderful at decision making, but they are good at classification, if, especially if you know the objects. All right, so image recognition with TensorFlow. So I need to locate known objects within a camera view. We are matching math. To do that, it matches masses of similarly colored pixels with our known library of such objects. So again, if I'm looking for a yellow block that's predominantly yellow or shades pretty close to a central yellow color, then I tell the, the camera to, as it looks out there and gathers information, I tell the computer to search that frame and find a mass of yellow pixels that are blobbed together in one area. So it might find them right here, right? So here, here's that object. Or if I'm looking for red, I might see this little curtain over here and say, aha, there it is, right? That's the thing I'm looking for. Once I have that, you can receive a centroid mapping the object to our view space. So this gives you an idea where the object is relative to the robot's camera. So when I get that, a centroid just basically means I, I take the, uh, all of the pixels and I average them together and I, get, I average their X and Y location or their X, Y, and Z location if I'm in three space. And when I average them, I get a centroid that represents the center of mass or the central point of that object. And then I'll receive back data to the robot that says, okay, given the orientation of the robot, this object is so far away from you in the X dimension, so far away from you in the Y dimension, and so far away from you in the Z dimension. So I'll get back that centroid that maps to that location. So then I can also, because it's looking for those blobs, as long as those objects are separate, if they're not overlapping, if, I'm, if I have one here and one here, then it will find that there, it'll say that there are two of them, right? So I can count how many of these objects uh, exist inside of the view. 
Um, there was a challenge recently uh, in one of the games in the last couple of years that started off with the robot looking at three different blocks, and it was trying to find the, uh, the yellow block, and the other two objects were white wiffle balls. And so it did that by saying, okay, I can look for the yellow object. But it knew that it was trying to find three objects to figure out, is that yellow one in the center? Is it in the left position or is it in the right position, right? And a lot of people struggle with that because if, and we'll talk about this in a minute, if it couldn't find all three objects, then it was kind of stuck in a weird spot, right? So, but it can, it can use TensorFlow can tell you how many of those objects are in the view of the camera as well. Additionally, we can see a diversity of objects within the view based on known models for each. So if I, as I just mentioned, if I'm looking for a yellow, a yellow um, a cube or and I'm looking for a white wiffle ball, um, I can see the diversity of objects because they, they are differentiable, right? I can tell which one is which. And so TensorFlow is optimized for multi-core operations. So it's both parallel and distributed. So if I run this TensorFlow on a computer with a lot of horsepower, then it's optimizing itself to run as fast as it possibly can. Most of you are using phones for your image recognition. And so the better your phone is, the, the more horsepower it has, especially the number of parallel cores that it has, the more computing power it has in that context, then the faster and the better this TensorFlow will work. Right? So one of the advantages we're trying to avoid is that people with higher budgets can have fancier phones, which is why every year first tends to limit the phones, that, the phone choices that you have. But just so you know, outside of first, when you're doing this kind of research and this work, then the more cores you have, the more uh, the, the, the TensorFlow algorithm is optimized for uh, that constructed environment, that large computing, high performance computing environment, it will perform even better. And so if you move out of the real world where you're working on a different kind of budget and you're trying to fulfill the obligation for a company or for a project at school or something, then you will want to tend towards the higher performance phones or perhaps something like a Raspberry Pi or an onboard computer, Arduino board, something with an offboard processor so that you can speed up that ability for TensorFlow to work. In our case, we're gonna run it on a phone and that's perfectly fine for us. It optimizes itself to run on the phone for you. Very, very nice. So the implementation of TensorFlow is library based, so it's easy to use and it's very, very powerful. So a lot of this hard work that somebody somewhere had to do, uh, we'll call them Google as an example, uh, whomever it might have been, but, uh, but we'll call them whatever. And they did a lot of work and they provided a library for us that teaches us and tells us how everything works. So we can make calls to that library and say, help me find these objects or give me back a direction, a, a direction or an orientation of how to get to this object, the location of this object relative to me. Um, and they can be updated so you can see that you're moving towards an object as an example. All right, so that's a little bit about the TensorFlow library, a little bit about where it's coming from. Um, just an example kind of of how that works. You can see um, this is running in uh, on a phone. And so you're looking back at it and it's showing you uh, where it is found. It's a bounding box is what that blue, uh, the blue uh, sort of rounded rectangle is. That's the bounding box. And then the purple is a tag identifier. And so it's telling you how big that object is in the camera's view. And so this is an example where TensorFlow found a block for us and it identified it with the bounding box to say it's fitting inside of this box. And it can feed us back some properties about how far away it is from a certain object. And here you see some scribbles of how it would uh, find its pathway or how the robot could find its pathway to that object based on this, on this, this distance. So um, some other examples of TensorFlow, right? We've just talked about this. You have this bounding box. And what you're going to get back is you're going to get back a left boundary and a top boundary. And you're going to get, using that left and top boundaries, you'll be able to get and figure out a, a size of the object. And that size can tell you a lot about it. If it's a known object, you can utilize that to help you figure out how to think about um, where that object is and how far away it is from you using parallax. Um, you also have the same idea here. You have the same left boundary and the top boundary in this orientation, right, when you rotate the camera sideways. Um, by the way, those other blue dots are other things that it found that it thinks might be good candidates, uh, but they're too small for us. Um, those are typically light-colored specks that are uh, on the mat. I know some of you are shocked that the mats aren't always perfectly clean, um, but it's okay because they're so much smaller than the, than the object we're trying to find then the TensorFlow algorithm works really well. So TensorFlow is gonna feed back to you a left and a top boundary. From there, you can surmise what the cube or the rectangle is gonna look like that would bound that, and you can get a measurement on how big that object is um, that, that fits inside of it, and that will give you an idea of distance away from that object. 
So just some examples of output from, uh, from TensorFlow. And here it is running on, on the uh, phone. Some of you might well remember this task, as I mentioned. Um, you see that it has categorized three different objects. On the left-hand side is the yellow cube I mentioned. And notice it has a red bounding box around it. And then notice in the center, in the center position is a white wiffle ball. And that white wiffle ball has a blue square uh, around it. And then the second white wiffle ball has a teal uh, has a teal border around it. So the purple, the thin purple box is the same for each one, right? Um, here are three objects I found and their relative sizes in the camera. But then the color of the bounding box is showing you that I can tell these objects from each other. These are not the same object to me. These are three separate objects that it found. And this is how we use that in this particular example to figure out which one was the yellow block. And because if you got the yellow block and you picked it up or you grabbed it or you moved it from its start location, then you would get more points rather than moving one of the other objects. And you probably remember you had to move the yellow object without moving the others so you could avoid that penalty. Um, each year there are challenges like this where vision-based navigation would really be helpful to help you score more points, especially in the autonomous portions of your programs. All right, so that brings us to the second kind of topic and that is Vuforia. Uh, Vuforia is a trademark name for an augmented reality technology. The AR technology has been around for quite a while. And what Vuforia does is they use targets and tags uh, to, they recognize targets and tags, right? Um, things like QR codes and other things. And they can recognize that pattern. And when they do, they have an augmented reality ability to lay over that a, a scanned image or a picture image or an orientation bar or a marker of some kind. And they can return back to you again, this, the idea of a centroid of where that thing is located, where the center of mass of that object is. And so that can give you both a location and an orientation of that object. Uh, the Vuforia marker is using augmented reality, and so it can overlay that with another image as well, uh, which is very nice. I'll show you some examples of that here in a moment. So the targets that you get back from Vuforia can be used to identify certain objects. Um, they can be used as location markers to find a certain location, a known fix uh, on the field. If you know anything about navigation, you know that you have to have a known point to start from, and you have to have another either derived point or found point to be able to figure out exactly where you are, in, at least on a map. And you need a third one, a third fix, they call it, to figure out where you are in, in the third dimension. If you have ever used GPS, you know that you have a number of satellites, and each one of them essentially has given you a distance from yourself to that target based on the differential of time it took to get the signal from each one of those satellites, right, in synchronous and in, in, in the as they're synchronized, um, they have a synchronized clock, then your GPS can determine if it has an, a certain number. I can tell you where I am in an XY plane of the world. If I have a n more satellites, I can give you an XYZ picture of where I am. And if I have one more, I can give you both a, an altitude uh, relative to that plane as well. Um, so uh, another example of that sort of triangulation that you can use. And so that's the, this last point, triangulation or a constellation of markers provides a relative location. So if I can see one object and I know where that is in the map of the world that I have, and I see another marker and I see those two and I see their orientation, I see where I am relative to them and I know where they are in a map, I can fix my location within the field. And this is going to be much, much more accurate than doing something like counting how many um, clicks your motor has moved forward or, or trying to just, you know, rough out, oh, it's half a second forward and turn left for half a second and then go forward for 1.2 seconds. Um, that's never going to be accurate or never going to be consistent consistently accurate. And so when we use vision-based navigation, then what we're doing is we're increasing our ability to be, to be consistent. And one thing we need in the robot world, especially if you've done much with, with robotic competitions, it's much better to be consistent than it is to be good every once in a while, right? Um, that consistency is, helps you to be, uh, to be able to build on that and get better and better and better over time. And so that's what we can use the Vuforia markers uh, around the field for or on certain objects within the field inside of FTC. But in the real world, we use them all over the place for all kinds of markers. We use Vuforia markers when drones are trying to identify certain robots. So I, build, I do a lot of research with multi-robotic systems. And so we'll put Vuforia markers on robots that are on the ground. And then our drones will be able to fly over them and identify which robot is which from the air based on being able to see that Vuforia target. And because of that target, because it has an orientation to it, they can also tell which direction that robot is heading. Um, and so they can get an, a, not just a position, but an orientation for, uh, for those robots in, inside of that robot team. All right. So because they're augmented reality, the targets can be replaced with a virtu in virtually with either a 2D or a 3D object. So a flat planar object or something in, in three dimensions as well. 
So the virtual items can be interacted with if you have some kind of augmented reality goggles or and or data gloves. Um, most of you are getting more and more familiar with virtual reality. And in VR, you have a closed headset and you're looking at a projected image all the time. In augmented reality, you're looking through the lens at the world, at the real world, and you're laying data on top of that. In either case, I can interact with those objects. If I have something like a data glove or a wand of some kind, I can reach into my view and grab an object and rotate it around or stretch that object or move it to another location if I wish to, right? Um, and then maps or directional arrows or avatars, all of those things can be placed on targets to, get for, to use for both navigation and guidance, right? So they help you to have that orientation again as well. So here are some examples. On the left-hand side, you see a, um, a, a, the, um, the phone has found a Vuforia target from one of, the, one of the first competition games. And you notice it has a blue and a green and a red uh, marker on it. It's a triangle, it looks like this, right? And so that gives you an orientation. So it's an X, Y, and Z plane. Depending on the way you orient the world, uh, if you're a graphics person, or if you're a 3D, 3D artist, you'll have different orientations sometimes. Uh, but a lot of times we use X and we use Y and then Z comes out of the screen. Uh, but that's not always true. A lot of uh, systems use uh, Z to go uh, one way and Y comes out of the screen. It, they're all a little bit different. But you need to know the orientation of your, of your system to be able to understand how to orient these markers. These other ones are just different kinds of markers. Some of them are very QR code looking. Some of them are quite specific. But in each case, they have to be unique so that when the computer sees those, it can identify that is marker number seven or marker marker A or location, you know, Bravo's three or something like that. So it can understand each one of those. And here are some other FTC markers from across the years as well. But this is what Vuforia is doing. It's looking in the camera view for those objects. How does it do it? exactly what I talked about from the beginning, where it's using computer vision. And the beauty of this, especially if you can fix two targets, right? I can get a very clear picture of where I am on the field. And it's very, very accurate. Now the accuracy may depend on the quality of your camera and the speed of your, of your phone. But in general, they're very fast because they're finding these targets and the targets have an orientation to them. So we can be very precise about where they are and how we're seeing them. And they also give us a lot of feedback about exactly the distance to them. Um, so because of those things, we have an orientation, we have a scale, uh, we can get a lot of data from a Vuforia marker and figure out exactly where we are on the planet. Okay, a couple of tips and tricks and hacks to close out our chat time together here. Um, first off, let's talk about cameras. So in, in first revised competition, um, in FTC and FRC, there are rules about which kind of cameras you can use and what kind of phones you can use. So be conscientious about that. Everyone always wants to use the latest, greatest phone, but because at first we, we worked really hard to make sure that we can all you know, compete on a level field, uh, we do restrict the kind of phones that are available to those that are readily available for all teams. So you can use the camera on your phone. This isn't a terrible idea, but sometimes it means that you're putting your phone in a very vulnerable location that you may not want to, or you're asking your phone to run the robot and to do this vision piece at the same time. So you might wish that you used a webcam instead. Um, there is some new technology with the control hub um, and with our ability to interface into the, uh, to the various hubs that you can add an HD high definition micro cam or a webcam as a device that is purely doing that camera getting the image retrieval for you, um, capturing those images for you. So the camera choice you make is very important because it has to be at the right location on your robot and that might not be exactly where you wanna put your phone, right? Um, so I, I've seen it many times where someone has their phone in this great vi video position, they can see really well, and then they get going and the phone tilts sideways or dip falls out. And of course the robot stops running at that point. Uh, so you wanna be really smart about how you design it. So make sure you think through the camera location and whether I wanna use the, the camera that's on the phone or whether I want to use a, an external camera. I will tell you that most teams that are gonna to go to the higher levels are going to be moving towards using a webcam or a separate HD micro cam of some kind. Um, so they can put it exactly where they want, connect it with a simple cable, protect it really well, and not have to move their phone away from where they want it to be in a protected area. I just mentioned this a little bit, but this is about the placement of your camera. It really, really matters. You wanna make sure that you put it at a robot eye level. So that's very different than you. When you stand at the field, so suppose I'm six feet tall, when I stand at the field, my, my view because of parallax is very different from an orientation of what a four inch tall uh, robot might see. And when I say four inches tall, I mean the camera being four inches off the ground, what it might see. 
So you want to be very cognizant that you choose a location that gives you the best visibility for what you're trying to see. So you want to make sure that it has the right height. You want to make sure of the view angle. It's not looking too far down or too far up or too far left or right. You want it to look pretty much as straight ahead as it can. And you want to be careful with sturdiness or steadiness. So sturdiness is how rugged it is that doesn't get knocked over or knocked off. And steadiness is how uh, it keeps the camera. So if the camera is bouncing the whole time the robot's moving, then that's not very steady. You're going to have a lot of problems with, uh, with that. You're not getting a lot of image stabilization from your phone camera, uh, nor from your webcams. So you want to be really conscientious that you try to make it, make it so it's both steady and sturdy, right? It's not moving when it gets hit and it's not shaking around as it's, as it's moving along. And then be careful to make sure that it's not obscured, right? Um, you want to make sure that you don't have a beam in the way of it or it's blocked by some piece or you have a piece that moves, like a flag or something goes up or down, that that flag ever gets in the way of it. So make sure you're thinking through where it is it's not going to be obscured. All right, a couple of little coding things. There's so many of these. I wish we had an, uh, probably another topic talk about this. But code crashers, we call them, these things that really get you stuck. If you use while loops inside of your robot loop, so if you don't know this, I'll tell you that you should always build robotic code to be what we call live loop coding. And that means that it always rips through the main loop over and over and over again without stopping. So you can't use construct constructs like a while loop because a while loop will stay in that, uh, in that loop as long as that condition is true. So if you say while you don't see three objects, keep looking for more objects, well, guess what? You're stuck in that loop forever until it finds three objects, and it might not ever find three objects. So we've had a lot of people who have code with that. Instead of using a while loop and stopping the execution of your live loop code, which you never, ever, 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 ever want to do, right? You would much rather use an if statement. If I see three targets, then execute this bit of code. When I see three targets, right? So if I can see target A and B and C, then here's what I want to do. Or if I see this, then take this action. But you don't want to use while loops to say while wow, that's going on. Now, some of you get, get tempted with this when you have your robot moving forward and it's going to a distance, it's using a distance sensor, and you say, while the distance is, is greater than five, keep going forward. And that sounds great and that code will work. The problem is in between there, it's not doing any other processing because it is stuck in that while loop until that condition is met, right? So you're just stuck in that while loop. You're not doing any obstacle finding. You're not getting any information from your camera. You're not doing any obstacle avoidance. You're not doing anything else other than that. So be really careful about using while loops in there. Um, other code crashers are when you have it only, it, it only proceeds if it finds a certain object and then it gets stuck in a loop otherwise. So be conscientious about that. Just think about things that can go wrong. Don't assume it's going to always see an object or recognize an object. So we use a lot of things that are like timeouts, right? In our, in our autonomous code, if it, it will try for about five seconds to try to find the object. If for whatever reason, and it can happen for a variety of reasons, I'm sure you've encountered all of them, uh, someone forgot to uncover the camera or turn it on or someone forgot to plug in a cable, whatever the case is, whatever reason the lighting is different, something changed, then, then I have it wait for five seconds, it times out and says, okay, quit looking for that and move on to the next bit, the next step in my autonomous code, right? Keep working down your autonomous code. So little timeouts like that, little um, escape values are ways that it can just look a few times and then move on with the rest of its life, right? So sometimes doing, doing something is better than doing nothing, right? So make sure you, you think that through, beware of code crashers. All right, image segmentation can also help. Um, so in that code, I don't mind, I guess it's far enough past that I can probably share my little tip that we use. So in the, the example I gave you, there was, there was a, a, a two white, and they could have been in any location, it was randomized, right? Uh, by the way, it wasn't randomized, it was pseudo randomly. Uh, generated, but we'll, we'll let them say randomize. Um, it, they would randomize it and they would move them into one of three locations uh, for the white, for each of the white balls, and one of the three locations held the yellow ball. And the idea was to figure out which is which. Well, what people, a lot of people tried to do, and the sample code did, was it said find three objects and see if the yellow one is in the, is left of one and right of one, or if it's left of both of them or right of both of them, and it used three objects. What we found was that it was very inconsistent. It would take forever to find all three objects sometimes, and that wasted precious seconds in our autonomous code. What we instead did was, was we said, okay, find the yellow cube and then give us some math about where it is. Is it, with, is it less than 250 pixels from the left or more than 250 pixels to the right? 
or is it between those things? And so we did a quick loop. You found it, great. Horizontally, is it mostly to the left or mostly to the right? And then we would just move, run our code and go get that object. So in other words, we used image segmentation. We used zones. And we weren't concerned about where it was, whether it was 493 or 494. We were concerned, was it left, right, or center? And so we had code that would run and find it from there. Right? Worked very successfully once we changed our code away from finding three objects and said, just use image segmentation to figure out, is it in zone one or two or three? It was much more successful. So think about that. Uh, sometimes the objects you're looking for are from half the screen down, right? Sometimes they're, 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 they're on the ground, so to speak. So don't waste energy looking up here for markers. Look down on the ground because that's where the thing you're looking for is. Or if you're looking for a marker, it's going to be in the center of the screen from the camera's point of view to only check the center of your screen because your robot hopefully isn't looking up at the sky or looking down at the ground a lot. Hopefully it's looking straight ahead most of the time, right? All right, um, some other things you can do is preview. When you, uh, and, and uh, you need to make sure you check with the FTAs and check with the referees because this is always subject to change. But one of the clarifications we got two years ago and we've been able to use each year is that you can set up your robot in the starting position and you can turn on the camera preview and you can make sure that you're seeing what you're supposed to see. So you can make sure that it's seeing. Now you can't run code, you can't do any, any image processing, but you can at least verify your, your phone is, your camera is working and it is seeing the right, the angle is correct for what you wanna be able to see, et cetera. So make sure you check that when you set up your robot every single time. On that long list of things you do every time you put your robot on the field, you might wanna preview that and make sure. One other consideration, and this is probably the bane of all people that have ever tried to do computer vision um, or line following or anything, and that is lighting. Lighting is very critical color is an illusion to us. Um, generally, we're talking about reflective light and colors are a reflection of the light that's bounced off of them. So if you bounce white clean light off of, a, of an object, you get one hue of that color, um, one particular tint of it. If you instead bounce a yellowish light off of that same object, you will get a slightly different hue. And that differentiation can, can wreak havoc on color sensors. It can wreak havoc on all sorts of things. We had a, um, a challenge where you had to, to find the red ball or the blue ball, whatever color, you, whatever team you're on, and you had to knock it off of the stand. And if you did that, you would get a bunch of points for it. And it was really hard because in various lighting conditions, blue wouldn't look that blue and red wouldn't look that red. It was really difficult. So we had to be careful with our code to make sure that we were being wide for blues and very narrow for the difference between red and blue. Right, um, but lighting is very critical because colors are a reflection and not an emission. Now, you do have some things like a light bulb that emit a colored light. Um, you do have things like an LED that emit a colored light, uh, and, and that, that is true. But most of the objects you're trying to find in computer vision are not illuminating themselves. They're not emitting light, they are reflecting light, and lighting will change. So my free tip to you is make sure that you try out your code in a wide variety of circumstances. Also a little free tip, write your code so that the values are modular, okay? So write your code so it looks between um, yellow value minimum and yellow value maximum. And then up in your code at the top, you have, you have two variables that assign what yellow min and yellow max are. And that way, when you get to the field, the competition day, you can go to the practice field and you can try it under the correct lighting, or under the same lighting, and you can calibrate it using those min and max numbers without having to change any of your running code, right? It's a very smart way to think about parameterizing your, your code. That's what that's called. When you use parameters at the top of your code, sorry, parameters at the top of your code, to, that are used way down in your code. So never, ever, ever have specific numbers in your code. You should never have hard-coded numbers in code. You should always refer to some variable in there. All right, so make sure you're thinking about that. Also, clean the camera. That's a very simple one. Um, be careful when you clean it. You don't actually make it worse. Uh, so don't just wipe it with your jacket or, or something nearby. Certainly don't use your fingers. Um, just try to find a clean cloth. There are all sorts of cloths, microfiber cloths you can use that will clean up that lens and put it in good position for you. And then be careful with your battery life. Um, the, the camera being on and, and the, the, the TensorFlow running or the Vuforia code running is quite expensive from a battery life perspective. And you want to be able to run run after run after run. As, you know, sometimes in competition, those runs are pretty close together. So clearly, I would tell you that the general rule is to change batteries every single run. So you always have a full battery. Um, but that's a different tip for another day. 
but I would tell you to make sure that when your code is running, that it turns on the camera, looks for what it wants, and then turn off the camera and then execute whatever code you want. So you can turn on and off the Vuforia, you can turn on and off the TensorFlow, so you don't leave it running the whole time, burning up uh, a lot of very, very critical battery life. So be careful about that and think it through. So a couple of little tips and tricks and hacks. All right, so that's my, my time for today. Um, this is a time when normally we would have questions, and when we show this live, uh, you'll be able to answer and ask questions during this time, and I will hopefully be around to, to answer those questions if it's at all possible. But if not, you can reach out to me or to team 10068 or to your regional coordinators or to your team captains or any anyone at your league and they will be able to get in touch with us with questions but of course the very best place you can go is to go to the forums the forums is where you'll discuss a lot of these topics so again my name is mike franklin very nice to get to hang out with you today. Thanks for paying attention to our talk and listening in. I hope it was useful for you. I really just scratched the surface and tried to whet your appetite for something that will radically change your perception of robotics and how they work. It will increase your ability for competition and, and scoring better and, and doing higher functioning robotics. But what it will really do is help you to understand how robots are really going to work in the real world. And so it will be a great thing for you to learn and practice with, even if it's a total failure as a robotics competition event. It will be a fantastic skill for you to learn when you transition to doing robotics in, as a full-time job in the real world. You'll do this kind of stuff all the time. So everything you learn is really applicable to your life. Hey, thanks again for tuning in with us. Have an amazing day.